welcome once more to the Indian Media TV. The pleasure is mine. What's your perspective on Joe's, you know, Joe Ajero's arrest? And do you think, or rather, do you believe it reflects a broader crackdown on dissent voices in Nigeria? I think that uh, the first place to locate what is playing out in Nigeria here is the fact that not too long ago, Ago, in the year of our Lord 2020, precisely the month of October, the APC government showed its predilection to stifling dissent. They showed its commitment to repudiating and reducing the rights and the freedoms of the people to disagree, to protest. And you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember the NSAD's protestation were innocent, orderly protesters were visited with terror. Agents of states decided to procure and um, pro pro procure violence against people who were dedicated to ensuring that their call for the repudiation of the SARS uh, unit of the police force was a reality, mm -hmm. but whether we like it or not, um, it was one of the great philosophers who said that eternal vigilance is a price for liberty. Those young men, our daughters, our brothers, and our sisters were able to win the battle against the SARS unit and the police, and they got SARS to be abrogated. Now, Fast forward to what we had about a few weeks ago. You also find that the APC has shown its predilection to stifling dissent. The freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom to disagree, freedom to air your opinion was expressed by young people in the end bad government protestation. And rather than negotiate, rather than engage with the people, rather than talk with the people, government enjoyed the deceit, the chicanery and the gaslighting that said that those boys were amorphous and unreachable. But when it came to arresting them, they were not amorphous and unreachable. Mm. Now, very importantly, I want to say that when we saw this handwriting on the wall, we asked questions. Mm. Those whose rise to political fame, those whose modern Olympic heights came through democratic protestation, mm. came through the expression of freedoms of liberty and rights, have refused to allow the Nigerian people those liberties. Mm -hmm. That's the, the irony of it all. Uh, remember in 2012, precisely, we were at Ojota from the month of January, precisely, I think, from the 12th of January. And people had coffins with the name of Jonathan written on it. People had goats and cows with the face and the name of Jonathan written on it. He didn't arrest, he didn't harangue, he didn't hound, he didn't send gun wielding and god trotting men to kill people huh. we saw that a few weeks ago now we don't even know the exact number some are saying 40 some are saying 28 but people were killed and you ask yourself should that be the lot of people under a seemingly progressive government should that be the lot of people under a government that talks about democracy and democratic rights and then let me say that my challenge as we talk this morning mm. is the fact that there is a descent to dictatorship. There is a descent to anarchy. There is a descent to trouble. Well, and save and accept something is done, save and accept the media and organized civil society rises to the challenge. I have said that the 
greatest victim of dictatorship and despotism is the media. They always consider the media as enemy to, to, to despots and dictators. So they will come after the media. I, I hope that uh, they understand the urgency of now and the reality of now. Mm. So, Prof, um, thank you very much for that uh, insightful, um, you know, submission. The treasonable charges against the ENTS governance protesters have raised, you know, alarm, obviously, uh, about the future of free speech in Nigeria. You made allusion now to the press, but do you think that this type of uh, uh, charges that this signals a shift towards authoritarianism? Clearly, clearly in your question is the answer. Uh, when you harass, harangue, and hound protesters to court to stand trial for treason and treasonable felony, you ask yourself, what is the uh, pointer? It's increasingly an unfolding dictatorship because there is nothing in the expression and exercise of the freedoms to protest, freedoms to dissent, freedom to disagree that comes near uh, treason and treasonable felony. You ask yourself, are they soldiers? Are they armed with guns? Did they go to Asurok? Did they come to the three armed zones? And then you ask yourself again, what is that common street cliche, the phraseology, the witch cried last night and the child dies this morning? Every passing event signposts the unfolding, the emergent dictatorship. Every passing event signposts the emergent despotism. You don't, only despots think about charging protesters for treason and treasonable felony. And you know the intention over all future protesters, threatening future protesters. When they look at the fact that, oh, uh, those who protested yesterday were charged for treason and treasonable felony, they get very scared. Because treason is punishable by death. At the best, life imprisonment. So when you look at this huge charge, this heavy charge and the heavy penalty, uh, you will be scared. That's actually what they're about. They want to threaten the people. They want to stifle dissent. They want to stifle the liberties of the people. And what is the precursor to? The, the, the simple signpost is the fact that I want to be a maximum ruler. I want to be a despot. I want to be a dictator. And I don't want you to ask me questions. That's actually what they're trying to say. But I want to say, Mazi, that fundamentally, our country's historicity has proven otherwise. That Nigerians are unwilling, have always been unwilling to allow for despots and despotism. Remember, uh, after the war, when Gowon thought he could continue after nine years in power, the anger, the pain, and the pants at home led ultimately to what uh, was otherwise an unsuccessful coup but he couldn't continue as a commander-in-chief. Remember also that when Muhammad, uh, Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida thought as a Maradona he was, that he could continue in power, gave a very free-flowing speech when he announced June 12th, that the masses of our people rose up against it. And they said no. And by way of a bad grammar, he left power. He said he was stepping aside because he couldn't contain the protestation. you sincerely and, and a lot of young people who were in the final years in the university, who were out there as members of NANS, were in the Kurudu Road. They later batched and mowed down about 80 of our colleagues, were lifting dead bodies, but we said no. And ultimately, Babangida left. When Abacha thought that he could transmute from a military head of state, like what had happened in several African countries, Remember, he thought he could move from the Kaki to the Abada and become a civilian head of state. The Nigerians resisted him. They made it so impossible for him to continue in power. Don't forget that 
At some point, he was terminally ill, but he couldn't travel overseas for medical treatment. That is how strong and thick the ability of the Nigerian people to say no to emergent dictators have been. Mm. In Abacha, couldn't travel. He died in power. As you and I talk uh, through several uh, efforts in a democratic uh, journey to make leadership responsible and responsive to the people, you sincerely was detained by our passenger for months. But you know what? When the courts ordered for my release, I was arraigned in court and granted bail. Under the APC, for years now, we have had several court orders asking for the release of Mars in Namdekano. Consistently, the APC government has a predilection and a tendency for dictatorship and despotism. I've refused to release Mars in Namdekano. And as you and I talk, when we talk that the man who will tell us that he's a civilian president from the South, will look at Mazin Namdekano's case with some air of magnanimity, some air of empathy. Alas, the opposite has become the case. When young people were asking for a protestation against bad governance, they played the ethnic card. They told us that the North was interested in sabotaging the presidency of a man from the South. And I asked the question, if so clearly and so auspiciously the South card comes handy, why isn't Namdekano still in prison? Why haven't they played the South card in obeying court orders and granting him bail? The point is that this government is not only pharisaical, this government is hypocritical, this government hates the freedoms enshrined in Chapter 4 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. This government does not want people to disagree with it. This government does not want people to protest. This government does not want dissent. But I want to say to them that it is wistful. It is masturbatory hallucinations for them to think that you can hold the Nigerian people down. Nigerian people will say no. Uh, interestingly, when Joe Ajero came out of custody, he said this is the beginning of the battle for the freedoms that Nigeria and Nigerians want. And then young people are saying that if nothing changes, come October 1st, and bad governance protests pro Max will come. Mm. And I believe that and I've said repeatedly that eternal vigilance is the price for liberty. Nigerian people will fight for their freedoms, they will stand on their freedoms, and they will say to Bola Ahmed Tinubu and his minders that the liberties enshrined in our constitutions are sacrosanct. Now, I believe that um, after Joe Ajero came out from DSS dungeon, that uh, you had spoken to him, we read that the reason of his arrest is as a petition written by APIS Nigeria. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and APIS came out to say that they had withdrawn that case. Now, long ago. Long ago. So looking at, I want you, this question is in two, in two plans. One is your interaction with Joe Ajero. What is your key takeaway? Two, how do you feel that in 2012, a man whom you protested with, a man whom you know very well, as you know, but obviously uh, during good luck, Jonathan, now becomes the president of a federal republic. Those activities that he so sponsored, those activities that he took part in, now becomes treason. How does that make you feel? Well, let me say clearly first that when our brother, my friend, and the labor leader, uh, Comrade Joe Ajero, when he came out of custody, he went into a series of meetings and uh, I reached out to him, was spoken. And clearly, the DSS lied. He wasn't detained on account of a petition by Epis. And interestingly, Epis came out almost immediately to say, no, 
yes, we wrote a petition last year. Yes, the petition wasn't immediately attended to. But yes, also, we have resolved the issues of the petition. So there is no reason whatsoever for Comrade Joe Ajero to be arrested on account of that petition. Joe came out and said that the reason he was arrested and the reason the, uh, the trip he was meant, meant to make to the UK to address the trade union conference was botched by the oppressive agency of state was well, because they wanted to ask him to answer a few questions about treason and allegations of treasonable felon. And he said that no invitation was sent to him by the DSS. Oh. And remember that a few weeks ago, along with the Leonard Sig, Comrade Femi Falana, and several other colleagues of ours, Joe Ajero had visited the police headquarters to answer to similar inquiries and inquisition. Mm. And then he came out afterwards to say, when next you need me, I will come. For what reason was, for what reason did the DSS arrest him? That's the first question. To overawe him, to threaten him, to threaten those who disagree with government, to stifle dissent, and they were rudely shocked that Nigerians reacted almost spontaneously. I wrote a piece immediately calling out government and saying that the arrest of Joe Ajero and the charges of treasonable felony against the protesters were signposts of the intention of this government to stifle dissent and were signposts of an emergent dictatorship and despotism and have been vindicated when the labor organization rose up and said that if you do not release Joe Ajero before 12 midnight they will shut down the country they couldn't believe that the people will rise up so quickly and so early in the day to challenge these issues and across the country people rose up don't also forget that the same day the office the Abuja office of Sarah was invaded by the operators of state. Mm. And you ask yourself, what are these actions pointing at and pointing to? But I think that very unfortunately, those who are around Mr. President have refused to understand the urgency of now. And that brings me to the second leg of your question. Is there a deliberate effort of government to stifle dissent? The answer is yes. Is there a deliberate effort by government to overawe the people and threaten potential protesters? The answer is yes. Is there a deliberate effort by government to hold down the people? The answer is yes. But the, leg, the next leg of, to that answer is the fundamental reality. Will they and can they succeed? Not even the military with their jackboots and their guns and their bullets and their Saladins and their armored tanks could achieve that. Not even their experts in rhetorics could achieve that. So a government that has colossally failed, and I say this advisedly, a government that started with flippy, floppy, and foul economic policies had not achieved that against the people. If this government were succeeding in the economic front, if there was no hunger, despondency, poverty, and anger. It just might, people would say, oh, let's allow this government. Things are working. But you're failing on the economic score. You're failing on the emotional score. You're failing to empathize with the people. You're involved in waste, wanderlust, profligacy. And like a senator of the APC said, you're victim to kleptomania and kakistocracy. And yet you think you could just wake up someday and say to the people, you must listen to us. It doesn't work that way. And so I, I think that uh, this government must realize that you cannot beat a child and refuse the, the child the right to cry. Enough it happened. This government must understand that the Nigerian people 
to ask for their rights and protect their liberties. Anything otherwise will be anathema, and the Nigerian people will resist it. So I hope and I believe that those who are observing the evolution in a political amphitheater will talk to Bola Ahmed Tinubu and his minders to understand that uh, there's a street cliche that comes handy, that threatening is just one word, action, not blood. Nigerians will not allow anybody to threaten them, power them, and hold them hostage. Nigerians will not allow it. It will not happen. They must understand that the freedoms enshrined in Chapter 4 of the Constitution, Dito, the freedom of speech, the freedom to assembly, the, the freedom of assembly, the freedom to hold talks, and the freedom to disagree with government, are sacrosanct, and the Nigerians will defend it because we understand that eternal vigilance is the price for liberty. Now, um, thank you for that. Um, two days ago, we all read that um, we all read the leaked memo that says that whenever Omoyele Sowere, the publisher of uh, Sahara Reporters, who currently resides in New York, whenever he comes into Nigeria, that he should be arrested. So does that then mean that, as you pointed out before, how swiftly Nigerians reacted when Je Ojo Ajero was arrested? Does that then mean that the Nigerian state and those that manages a security apparatchik hasn't learned anything from the recent happening? Always in history, when dictatorship when despotism begins to unfold, yeah. you have people who are parachutes of such despots. You have people who sing Handel for would be despots. You have sycophants who advise them, and there's a common cliche amongst them heaven will not fall. You have people who tell them the worst is two, three days. The people will get tired and go back home. But you know what? These people are oblivious of our history. If Omore Sprewe comes back and they arrest him, the young people who have shown an unwillingness to accommodate despotism will rise. If they harass me and harangue me, and I've told them I'm waiting. You know, my article said that clearly after Joe Ajero, who next? Maybe me. If they come, the young people will show a predilection to ensuring that they protect freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. This government must realize that what they should do is to busy themselves about fixing the government, is to busy themselves about dealing with poverty, hunger, and despondency, is to busy themselves about fixing the problems of security challenge in the North and across the country. And let me say this uh, very importantly. Why is it so easy for government to go after the Spidom, 99 oppressed? He's in Kujie prison on remand for acting as a whistleblower and for challenging corruption in this government. There's several people across the country who are in custody for speaking up against corruption and against the policies of government that hasn't fared well. It is very easy for this government to have them arrested and put in custody. But consistently, it has been almost impossible for government to address issues of banditry, insurgency, and criminality. It is almost impossible for government to arrest a certain Belo Toji who is threatening the Nigerian state and threatening farmers in the north. It is almost impossible for government to arrest those who are displaying monies gotten in exchange for ransom or kidnap for ransom traders online. We see them everywhere, displaying pictures of their loot. Whereas the security agencies are unable to arrest them, it is very easy for them to arrest protesters. And you think this is funny? Nigerians are not 
easily swayed by the gaslighting of operators of states. No, no, no. Nigerians are clear-headed and they're asking, why not deal with these issues first and then find out that Nigerians will support you. If farmers can assess their farms without paying 30 million naira ransom or tax to bandits, if people can travel from point A to point B without fear of being kidnapped and their families asked to bring some ransom, if people can sleep with their eyes closed at night, if people can go to sleep with food in their stomach, Nigerians won't be troubled about what you do. But consistently, this government has shown that it lacks empathy, that it lacks direction. This government has shown its predilection to ruderless watch. This government has shown that it doesn't care. Whilst asking Nigerians to tighten their seatbelt, it is involved in proclivity, wanderlust, kleptomania, and waste. And so you ask yourself, what gives this government the impetus to think that it can hold down a stifled dissent? Like it's you. impossible. It's impossible. And so I, I advise the minders of this government to go back to Mr. President and tell him your policies are making our job difficult. Go back to Mr. President and tell him your policies are the sufficient agent provocateur. Hmm. Go back to this government and tell them that your policies are the reason Nigerians will refuse to heed your advice and caution. And go back to the minders of this government to tell them enough of your sycophancy. Fix the economy, fix security, and you find out that Nigerians love you. These are the fundamental issues that we must address going forward. Thank you very much, Prof. Before I let you go, my final question will be, um, with the growing fears of uh, descent into dictatorship, obviously, those are the points you've, you know, brilliantly laid on this table. What strategies should civil society and political activists like yourself adopt to ensure their voices I had in this challenging time that Nigeria has found itself in. We're getting closer. We're talking more frequently. We're engaging online and offline. We're forging a fundamental brotherhood, knowing very well that despots and dictators are comrades in villainy. Knowing very much that the trade of despots and dictators is violence and impish conduct. So we have come out and we're engaging a different fora. In the past one week, we've had several meetings, both online and offline, and we're preparing for getting set. For us, it's not about agonizing, it's about organizing. And we're saying to Mr. President and his team, you haven't imagined how resolute the people are against dictatorship, do not dare the people, you know. And I want to say that uh, rather than spend so much energy in trying to stifle dissent, this government should spend so much time in trying to tackle insecurity. This government should spend more time in trying to fix the economy and rejig the public space and the trust of the people. Rather than threaten the people, look at Iba Ghani Adams, they are on Akakavu of Yoruba land. He rose up to say, Mr. President, time is going on you. You can't hold down the people. Afenifer is saying, no, no, no. We can't allow a descent to anarchy. We can't allow the descent to despotism and dictatorship. Nigerians are unanimous in repudiating the unfolding dictatorship and despotism. And they must realize that it is an idea that has been visited by steel bet. Nigerians will not allow it. We're talking, we're resolute. I'm waiting for an invitation by agents of state, if they so will and wish. And so many people are waiting. 
And the very day they call on one, they will call on all of us. Mm. For that best And we have said to them, open more detention facilities if that's what you want. But Nigeria will not go into anarchy. Nigeria will not allow dictatorship and despotism to fester. We will not allow it. And let me say, as I wind down, that the power of the people is stronger than the power of those in power. We will win ultimately because nature, because the universe and God Almighty is always on the side of those who fight for freedoms and liberty. Mm. Professor Chris Mustafa Mwokobia, Convener Country First Movement. Thank you very much for being my guest today. Thank you. God bless Nigeria.